everybody. I wanted today to talk about something which has occupied a lot of my professional life, even though I haven't talked about it so much on this channel. Some people might be aware of my other channel, which is now, I don't update really uh, very much, which is called Learn Gypsy Jazz and Swing Guitar. So I wanted to talk about um, some things I've learned about playing 1920s and 1930s style jazz guitar and um, share with you some thoughts I had about it and some hints and pointers for people who are perhaps new to exploring this era of music and this style of playing jazz. Um, now, uh, why? Why do this? Well, the first reason really for me was that I could get gigs doing it and um, I pay a lot for swing dancers and people who uh, enjoy vintage music and vintage clothes and that kind of thing. Um, there's quite a big scene of it and I don't think it's a... Um, I don't think it's kind of a fad. I think this has been around for some time. Swing dancing really picked up in popularity in the 90s, actually, and there was obviously a big thing with the film Swingers and all of that, and uh, bands like Big Bad Voodoo Daddy, but then it's slowly become more kind of interested in going back to the original music that those dancers were danced to, so that's a big thing. And then the kind of vintage thing, for me, it sort of maybe started in the mid-noughties, and you know 15 years later shows absolutely no sign of stopping um so this is a very popular style of music um and uh, i would definitely encourage people to go out and sort of uh, get gigs doing it because it's a lot of fun um as a jazz guitarist it's taught me a tremendous amount obviously about the history but also i think it's made me a much more specific and discerning musician i no longer hear music in the same way i'm much more specific about sounds and things like that and rhythms and I think it's been really good for my ear as, as I think learning any specific style is so um, I'll share my enthusiasm about it with you today anyway and see if I can get you enthused about it um, as a side point um, a friend of mine said that they noticed that a lot of the New York contemporary guitar players seem to have a massive soft spot for people like Eddie Lang and Django and I know that's true of Lago London I know that's true of uh, Julian Large and um, I didn't talk to Peter Bernstein about it, but it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> He's very influenced by Charlie Christian, who's a little bit later. A um, couple of things, speaking of Charlie Christian, I'm not going to cover the Charlie Christian style today. I'll do that in another video, because that's kind of its own thing. Um, and I'm not going to talk about Django either, because I think he's very well served. Um, his style is quite unique. Um, the only American player I can think really who is inspired by Django is Les Paul. And if you listen to early Les Paul, you'll hear um, somebody who had really modelled their style on Django. It's really interesting, actually, when Les Paul was playing acoustic guitar. Now, who should you listen to? Uh, I'm going to put a list of players up on screen so I can make, you know, in case I forget anybody, because there's loads of them. But the names that spring to mind of the original people around in that era, of course, Eddie Lang, uh, Nick Lucas, who are really um, the people who created the instrument in jazz, created the idea of playing guitar and guitar solos and that kind of thing. Um, so we, every guitarist who works in popular music owes them a huge debt, you know, because <laughs> they started it off. Without them, we'd all be playing banjo. Okay, and then um, you have other players like Dick McDonough, um, Carl Kress, um, great chord guys, um, Al Casey with Fats Waller, um, amazing, like, sort of quite a raw player, but great, like, really good, and surprisingly sophisticated. You, you think you've got him pegs, and then I'll do something um, surprisingly modern, you know. Very good chord soloist. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Alan Royce or Alan Ruiz. I don't know how you say his name. Um, people seem to say Alan Ruiz in the States. Um, Carmen Mastron. You can hear him with big uh, the big Mesh Beche Spanier Big Four, which has got Sidney Beche and Nugsy Spanier on it and uh, Wellman Bro on double bass. And he plays uh, some nice little crispy guitar solos on that. Uh, George Van Epps. Of course, George Van Epps is known as a finger stylist, but early on he was a plectrum guitarist. And when we talk about plectrum guitar, we are talking really about this era because the plectrum was the only way to get sufficient volume to be heard. Later on, George Van Epps is able to play fingerstyle with the aid of amplification. But in the early days, and if you seek out his early recordings, you'll notice him playing plectrum guitar in this kind of a style. It's probably the most harmonically sophisticated of that era. Um, who else? Um, you've got uh, the wonderful uh, Teddy Bunn, who had an amazing, amazing style, amazing time feel. Very bluesy player. Um, Lonnie Johnson as well. Uh, again, very bluesy. Um, there's loads of great ones. I, I'm surely must have forgotten of some. Um, in the modern era, today, 
um, I would suggest checking out Matt Munisteri, who I think more than anybody else I can think of um, has really gone back into the 20s and 30s style um, on the East Coast uh, and on the West Coast. I think uh, at least I think that's where he's based is Jonathan Stout, who's um, models his style really on I think Alan Ruse when he's playing acoustic guitar, um, and he's a really good player as well, very good exponent of the music, um, and uh, very much an obsessive in his style. So um, I wouldn't say that I'm a specialist, by the way. I wouldn't say that I'm obsessed with this era of music to the exclusion of anything else. But I would say that I find it a really charming and nice style of music to play and to listen to, and I really enjoy it. And um, my approach to it, I think, is always going to be a little more eclectic because I, I don't necessarily want to sort of recreate exactly the way people played back in the 20s and 30s. But I find that the way people did things back then is a great inspiration for my music. And I think I can hear people like uh, Bill Frizzell and Julian Large picking up on aspects of this earlier style and putting it into their own music. Um, and often, because we just think everything starts with bebop, you know, it's such a cornerstone of jazz education, often this earlier uh, music gets overlooked. And I think that's a shame, because I think there's a lot we can learn from it, even if we don't necessarily want to spend the rest of our lives playing that style of music in a historically correct way. Okay, so equipment, right. So this is um, something I wish I'd known at the time, and I'm going to give this advice, and I hope that people listen to it, because it saves a lot of heartache. So um, when we think of 1920s and 30s jazz, um, the instrument that might immediately come to mind is something like this. This is a Law LH600, which is a recreation of the Rolls-Royce, I think, of, uh, of archtop guitars of the early century, um, which is the Gibson L5. It's a copy of that. And actually, if you're familiar with the Gibson L5 from the era of Wes Montgomery, um, this might seem very different. Um, it's a 16-inch arch top, um, all carved, and it has um, a strange V-neck profile that puts a lot of people out. Actually, in fact, um, the Law, uh, this guitar, has a less pronounced V than the original L5s. Um, having had a chance to play a, a 1930s L5, I noticed how steep that V is. And the reason why they have such a crazy neck is because players back then used insanely heavy strings, okay? Um, this guitar actually has gauge 13 TIs on it, so it's um, practically a super strat compared to what Eddie Lang was dealing with. Um, and uh, yeah, what else can I say about this guitar? Um, obviously it's all acoustic, there's no pickup on it. Well, I mean, there's a piezo star pickup here, but there's no magnetic pickup, and it has a big, great big brassy <laughs> Which might surprise you if you're used to arch tops being very smooth, as we think of them now. We think of the L5, we think of Wes Montgomery in his suit purring away, playing this beautiful jazz guitar style. And of course, this instrument sounds nothing like that. You know, it's designed for projection, and um, these guitars had X bracing. Was it a parallel bracing? I can't remember. I remember the feeling. Parallel bracing. It's parallel bracing, which kind of gives a more kind of, you know, shorter sustain. So I play a chord and it's. Very punchy and very immediate, you know, um, which is not necessarily what you would hear in a modern day um, arch top unless the luthier had a specific sort of desire to try and recreate or was given a brief to re recreate the instruments of this era. Um, things like Benedetto's and I think even to an extent Eastman's that have a very good um, acoustic voice don't really have this kind of sound to them. They're more balanced, more like a flat top guitar in a way. So I think that um, I've, I've had people who own L5s play my law and say, yeah, this gets pretty close. Um, and uh, they don't make them anymore, these partic this particular model, but um, it's great. Um, but I wouldn't recommend you buy one. Why? <laughs> well, I would recommend you buy them if you're an obsessive about this style of music and can't afford an original L7 or something, which would be like the budget, the poor man's L5. A lot of um, people who are serious about this style of music have L7s because... The L5s cost uh, upwards, I think, of about 20 grand, maybe, if I remember correctly. Um, and the L7s can be had for like, you know, three or four grand still on reverb. Um, the reason why I wouldn't recommend getting this is because you're going to battle with amplifying it on, on, on gigs. And I've never been able to recreate the sound of this guitar on stage to my satisfaction. So sometimes I'll have like an acoustic gig and... Um, I'll take that guitar along. Okay, now the other guitar that everybody associates with this era is the Selma Macaferi, which is this thing here, right? Um, 
These guitars were designed by Mario Maccaferri, who was um, himself a guitarist, a classical guitarist, in fact, and became uh, very popular in Europe because I understand it was difficult to get hold of Gibsons and uh, Epiphones and similar types of archtop guitars that people were playing in the States. So a lot of people played these guitars instead. And have a, you know... <laughs> Very specific type of tone. Again, you know, very cutting, very brash, but slightly different to the arch top, I think. And um, obviously, um, the thing is, uh, oh, there's two two types: uh, grand bouche or D hole, and uh, petit bouche or oval hole. Um, uh, th these ones came first. The D holes were the original ones, the modern jazz, and then later on you had the uh, the oval holes. Now the problem with this guitar is it's so iconic, and it's so associated with Django and the gypsy jazz style that it's easy to forget that anybody else ever played these things but they did um mario mcferry produced classical models of this guitar they were played by people like al Boley, you know um and uh obviously you know great for big band rhythm guitar and all the rest of it so i think um the, the problem i have with this guitar is that i don't really think of myself as a gypsy jazz guitarist so when when i have to play this style of guitar i feel like i've got like um I've got like an imposter syndrome going on because I don't really, you know, think of myself as that kind of player. If, if I'm trying to do anything, I'm trying to recreate um, the era of that music rather than trying to play like Stockler Rosenberg or Borelli Legren or somebody, you know, or you know, Lola Maya. Those, those guys are all great, no, no, no beef against them, but it's not, it's not where I'm coming from. Um, and yet, you know, I obviously play this guitar a lot because it's really, really good. This is an Altamira M01D, by the way, it's, it's done some serious time in the trenches. There's been a lot of notes played on this guitar, and it's held up pretty well. Um, it's not an expensive instrument, about the same sort of price range as the Law. Um, and again, I probably wouldn't recommend getting one of these um, unless you are serious, partly because everybody will think that you want to be Django, but secondly because they are a pain in the bum to amplify. They're slightly easier to amplify than the Laws, but there's a lot of umming and ahhing and toing and froing you have to do. So what I would suggest as equipment, for somebody starting with this style, is something like this, which you probably already have. This is a electroacoustic guitar. It is also made by The Law. This is a Law LH200, I think. And it's a nice little um, small body acoustic. I really dug it out recently. And you know, you're not gonna be able to get the same kind of, same kind of brassiness out of it, but you can get, you can get it loud on stage and you can EQ it how you like. So I noticed quite a few sort of um, uh, vintage jazz guitar specialists have kind of gravitated this kind of instrument when they know it's going to be a difficult room and there isn't a sound engineer and everything else. And um, it just works very well. And it does need to be an acoustic guitar. I mean, you're probably thinking maybe, oh, you could put a magnetic pickup on the... Um, on the law or on the uh, you know one of those stimmer pickups you could put that on the maca ferry and have a loud on stage sound but the problem with that is it changes the character of the sound it becomes more like an electric guitar and that's that might be great if you're playing lead but i find for rhythm and particularly for this style the 20s and 30s stuff which is before um, um, uh, like magnetic amplification for electric spanish guitars really took off I find that um, kind of you lose the sound. So I think this is a really good compromise. Um, on this particular guitar, I've got uh, nickel bronze strings, which I really like, which are not a million miles away from the kind of strings that are available in the 1920s. They have a very much a broken in sound to them um, as soon as you put them on. Uh, unlike, say, phosphor bronzes. Phosphor bronzes are more recent. 8020 bronzes are, um, you know, another possible. Uh, option but I like these and I like the way they're gauged as well because they're heavy top light bottom which is great for jazz um, which might be different from what you want with the bluegrass setup where you're playing down the center of the neck a lot you know with, with uh, jazz you're often you're often kind of in this area of the neck or at least I find that I am not that the early players didn't play open strings down here but that's what I find anyway <laughs> 